From the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy! Your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy! I'm Sarah Foss, and I'm joined today by the dapper Dan of Disneyland, (laughs) Buzzy Cohen. Well, I did not bring the rest of the quartet with me, but I'm Uh, happy to be here, Sarah. I I knew you'd appreciate that reference. Yeah, of course. We're Disneyland fans. We're fans of the land. Happiest uh, place on earth. This morning on uh, the the podcast studio. Next to the podcast studio. This this morning on the drive to school, one of my kids decided, I want to go to Disneyland. Oh. I just, just like woke up with like that right feeling. right now or just like Just soon? in general, wants a plan. Okay. Wants to have a plan. Uh, wanted to call grandparents to see who would take them. Okay. It was a whole, yeah. It was interesting. Talked a lot about the Tiki Room and described it as spooky. So I think maybe the Tiki Room and the Haunted Mansion got ah, conflated a little bit in a four-year-old mind. There. Well, we could talk all day about we Disney. We could, because I have a trip planned in June. So, Ooh, okay. You know, maybe I'll piggyback on that. My older daughter's birthday. We're going in. I'm just saying. Buzzy gave me a great tip once. If you ever do yeah. go into the tiki room, you got to sit in the back because that bench has a lean-to. It has a back on it. So yeah. after a long day at Disney, go into the back row of the tiki room. You might even get a little nap. I've fallen asleep in that back row of the tiki in room. In the tiki, 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 tiki room. I love it. We listened to that original soundtrack in our car rides. Wally Bogue, I believe, is the name of one of those voice actors. Only a music producer would know that, Buzzy. Well, we could talk all day inside Disneyland, but I want to kick <laughs> off the show with a callback to last week's episode. And I just want to say this is why I love the Jeopardy! community. We received a message from one of our listeners, Chris, who also happens to be a meteorologist. And Chris mm. wrote, I appreciate the use of the word grapple, but the correct pronunciation of the word is not grapple, as Buzzy Cohen said it, but grapple with a short O sound in the first syllable, grapple. Mm. Well, I want to say we checked this. Chris, of course, is absolutely correct. But I just want to say I'm from New Jersey. I say things incorrectly. Poor Sarah. I think we've mentioned it a few times on the podcast. Had to coach me through a few (laughs) words when I guest hosted that doesn't always come out. But sometimes the New Jersey pops out of my mouth. And our podcast producer, Alexa, no help because she is from Delaware County, Pennsylvania, which also has a, a real rough accent going on. Alexa, I give a hard time because she can't even pronounce her last name correctly. So uh, she was certainly no help. But I do also want a little redemption. Last week, I don't know if you know this happened, Sarah, but I actually texted Michelle Loud, co-head writer, and I said, would you credit me if I said grapple and not grapple? And she actually pulled Billy aside and they concluded, judges ruling, they would have accepted my pronunciation. So while I did not pronounce it correctly, I had it Jeopardy correct. So is that a win? Sort of. But thank you, Chris. I love that everyone is keeping us honest. Wow, that's a lot to grapple with. (laughs) But yes, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate this feedback, you know. Buzzy, he, he rarely makes any mistakes, and according to our co-head writers, he didn't actually make a true mistake, but we always like when people are here to point those things out. I love our fans as well because they're kind of backing us up in recent days. You know, people mm-hmm. have been saying, nobody's letting us know when the hosts are switching and no warning. And I'm like, actually. Listen to the pod. Right here on Inside Jeopardy, we tell you exactly what's going to happen. You know right now, Mayim, she's hosting the high school reunion tournament. Guess what? March 10th, Ken Jennings coming back. This Friday. This Friday, as a matter of fact. He's going to host through April 28th. And then on May 1st, Mayim Bialik back for the rest of the season. So anyone, thank you. You are the people who are listening. Let those other folks know. We tell it to you here. We tell it to you straight right here on Inside Jeopardy. You know, it's like we have now a legion of the Inside Jeopardy listeners going out, doing the Lord's work, keeping (laughs) everybody informed so I don't have to individually respond to every DM asking who's hosting when and the details of all these amazing tournaments that the Jeopardy team has put together. Speaking of which, we are midway through the quarterfinals of the Jeopardy Quarter Quell High School Reunion Tournament. Well, that's where we're going to review, because we're actually, we're in the semis now, but we're going to review the quarterfinals. Let's do it. Heading into Monday. Cue the beep boops. We rejoined our quarterfinals with Rohan Kapileshwari, Claire Sattler, and Rhea Sinha. This was quite a game. Rhea Sinha from my neck of the woods in northern New Jersey. No Chatham very well. 
Uh, Rohan came out with a very strong Jeopardy round and really looked like he could run away with it. Yeah, but interestingly enough, you know, the Daily Double makes his stats look even better, but it really right. was an evenly matched round. Players with eight, nine, and ten correct responses, respectively. And it's interesting that Rohan earned this lead with the Daily Double and then in the Double Jeopardy round hits that second Daily Double, goes for the minimum wager of $5. Well, before we get into that, Buzzy, I have to call out the Daniel Radcliffe on Harry Potter category. Oh, I, yes. In the studio, everyone was so excited when that category was revealed. Probably no one more than Rhea. Her reaction of like, oh, my gosh, it's Daniel Radcliffe talking Harry Potter. This is so exciting. And even Mahim said, I know, it's amazing. After the category was finished, obviously the contestants went right to it. They went bottom to top, and then the audience actually applauded at the end of the category. It was just such a well-received category, and, you know, I was able to shoot this with Daniel Radcliffe in Toronto when he was promoting the Weird Al film, yep. and, you know, he did another category for us on I his career. That. But was generous enough to do this category in addition to the other one. We knew we wanted to save it for high school reunion tournament, so right. we've kind of been holding on to it for a few months, but... Daniel is a fan, he loves Jeopardy, and I was so excited to share with his team just how well this category had been received. Thank you, Daniel, for giving us that extra time, and thank you to Rohan, Claire, and Rhea, because they played a great double Jeopardy round as well. Rhea losing 3000 on the first Daily Double. Rohan with an interesting $5 minimum wager on that second Daily Double. Now, I don't know if people at home know that, but you have to wager something on a daily double. Yeah, and Claire actually explained on Reddit that just before that, the contestant team had just reviewed with them, okay, everyone, just want to remind you, the minimum amount is $5. So they thought it was particularly hilarious when Rohan bet just that. So let's talk about what he might have been thinking here. You know, it's late in the round. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make a big bet and then fall out of contention. Possible that Rohan wasn't feeling great about this category. Which uh, he did say. He's yeah. not a poetry guy. Not a poetry guy. So I'm not mad at it because he's still in the game for Final Jeopardy. I'm sure in hindsight wishes he had wagered a whole bunch more since he knew it. But, you know, people have done this before. I think that on a daily double, people tend to kind of like under bet generally. But people also sometimes overbet when it's late in a game. I've made that mistake. So I'm not mad at it. All right. Do you hear that, Rohan? Buzzy's not mad. <laughs> well, Claire was able to take that small lead over Rohan going into final. One of my favorite clues in Double Jeopardy, Southerners for 1600, the voice of Olaf on film. He's a native of Hollywood, Florida. Of course, the correct response, Josh Gad. Josh Gad has been on Celebrity Jeopardy. Yeah. He was on Twitter and TikTok after this clue came up saying a couple of thoughts here. Honored I'm a clue. Concerned that I'm a $1,600 clue. Thrilled that my girl got it in one second. Grateful she won $1,600 with my name. I think she was grateful too. Is he concerned that he's a $1,600 clue because it's like he's too obscure? I think maybe he thinks he should be a 2000 Oh, okay. It's sort of a double-edged sword, right? Like, do you want to be worth more? Right. Or do you want to be so easy? Everybody knows right. every detail. Yeah, well, you know what? Josh, Josh, if you're listening, let us know where that was coming from. <laughs> so we go into final with uh, Claire with 11400 Rohan right on her heels, $9,205. <laughs> and... Rhea still very much in the game because they are so close. Her 5,600 keeps her in play. Rohan betting zero. Rohan coming back with the small wager in final. Yeah. He bets zero, trying to come from second place. You imagine that either everyone's going to get it or no one's going to get it. I think that's a reasonable way to make, to make a wager. You know, if Claire gets it, Claire is going to bet to cover. So, Rohan, what you want to do is try to avoid betting everything and Claire getting it wrong and then not getting it. it, it there, there's a good argument to be made for this wager. I think Rohan, got to feel good, played a great game. Yeah, played a great game. They both get final correct. He wagers zero. She wagers a bit more. She's headed back to the semifinals, a place she is familiar with from her previous teen tournament. Yep. Claire actually said in the post-game chat, she was just loving Mayim's outfit. And then Rohan actually commented that all the contestants have been going nuts over Mayim's wardrobe. Love wardrobe chat. 
Not you enough. Do. Yeah, I do. Not enough of it happens, I think. So I'm glad that these young people are really engaging in that way. Shall we move on? Let's move on. <laughs> All right. Our seventh quarter quell or quarterfinal <laughs> game on Tuesday with Audrey Sachivi, Anish Maripodi, and Lucas Minor. Lucas found the Daily Double on the first clue people from Islands for 800. Boricua is a word for a person from this island or of its heritage. Lynn manuel Miranda is a proud Boricua. Mm-hmm. Lucas, he was right in on that. Wagered the whole shebang. Perfect pronunciation responded with, what is Puerto Rico? Mayam responds, correcto. I mean, it's a great start to the game. Great start to the game. Great Jeopardy round with everyone finishing within $1,800 of each other. Moving on to double Jeopardy. This is where the field started to spread out a little bit. Um, After a pretty evenly matched Jeopardy round, Lucas and Audrey start to duke it out. Yeah, and they both find daily doubles. They both finish the round with five-digit totals. But Lucas had that slight lead heading into final. And Audrey and Lucas are both getting final correct. Of course, Lucas being in the lead, he's kind of in the pole position. He gets to bet to cover, and he becomes our next semi-finalist. Yes, and in his final Jeopardy response, he wrote Bula Bula, which is, of course, the Yale football song, which is where he I like how you say, of course. Of course. I have no idea. Well, I should know that, right? We did go to Yale for a college championship many years Mm. ago, so I learned a lot about Yale way back when. Got to do a (laughs) clue with their mascot back in the day. Now, we have to say, Anish, you might be wondering... How was he thinking LeBron James? He responded LeBron James in this clue that had something to do about myth, not basketball. But he said, you know what? I just didn't know the answer. And I think LeBron James is the greatest basketball player of all time. So he gave a little shout out to LeBron. I like what you did there, Anish. All right, we head into our eighth quarterfinal game with Tim Joe, Dan Oxman, and Isha Sohail. I got to say, my favorite part about the Jeopardy round was the interview section. I mean, yes, Tim had a great round, 17 correct responses, off to a great start. finish. 10,600 at the end of the round. But it's the interview where Dan revealed that Mayim was his celebrity crush growing up. Yes. He said that he really admired how she played. And I know you and I went to the same place. We're like, oh, yeah, (laughs) awesome. And then he says (laughs) he really admired how she played a super awesome scientist. And then he found out she was a scientist in real life, and his mind was blown. Yes. As this story (laughs) began, I was like, interesting. You know, I think some people were more into boss. I had a crush on six, and then all of a sudden, it's like Big Bang Theory. I don't know how old I was when that show was airing, but it was not like... Crushed. Yeah. It was not the crush days. It wasn't the crush days. So you were six. Someone out there, many people out there were Blossom. I was Joey Lawrence. Whoa. Oh, yeah. That happened. Something for everyone on that program. You know what? Sharon Stone... She was into this because she actually commented on our social team's post, OMG, with heart emoji, faces, and a fire. So, you know, she's excited about Dan's crush as well. I feel for you, Dan. It's got to be hard to be up there playing with your... With your celebrity celebrity. crush. Like, for me, the person I remember having a crush on when I was like, you know, 12 or whatever was Claire Danes, my Ah. so-called life. And uh, so if Claire Danes was hosting the show and I had to play, I think I would have a hard time... Dan, I love you. You did a great job in spite of having kind of a tough game. However, it wasn't all Tim Joe. In the double Jeopardy round, Isha really played hard. Yes. Couldn't quite make it not a runaway, but really came up. And Tim and Dan missing both those daily doubles. Tim with a runaway, even $20,000 joins our semifinalists. Yeah, Isha correct in final. She said in the post-game chat that she had two goals coming into the tournament. She wanted to get a daily double correct, and she wanted to get the final Jeopardy correct, both of which had not happened in her first appearance. So she said, while I did not achieve the daily double, she got her final right, and I am so very happy about that, she said. Happy and proud. Yeah. Doing Bakersfield proud. Now we have eight of our semifinalists Brings us to Thursday where we will find our ninth semifinalist and close out that semifinal field. It will be among one of these three people. Hannah Neckritz, (laughs) Caleb Richmond, and Maggie Brown. Come on down. I feel like you set me up there. I really did. Yes. Yes. Well, Caleb absolutely dominated this Jeopardy round. 16 correct responses, 22 buzzer attempts, and a (laughs) $5,018 
Daily Double. Yeah, you know what he didn't dominate, which none of them did? The category in the sport. Tough Mm. category for all three of our contestants. And by the fifth clue, Caleb said, let's finish out in the sport. I just want to get rid of it. And then when they all missed that final clue, he joked, the internet is going to love this. I think people have enjoyed it, not at their expense, but, you know, people comment. Sports, sometimes they're really tough. They are. It's a whole genre of trivia. There's yeah. so much information. We had a whole type of Jeopardy, sports yes. Jeopardy, dedicated. How can you know everything about everything? It's just not yeah. possible. I will say I know that uh, Jeopardy contestants are often typecast as not knowing about sports. A lot of great contestants, James Holtzauer, who will be back for Masters, among them really know a ton about as, sports. As Amy Schneider. I mean, Amy Schneider, She presented absolutely. an entire category on the Warriors. So I did like knowing that Caleb had done bar trivia with fellow tournament players. Tegan O'Sullivan, um, and they came in second with their team name Peaked in High School. I think they're going to have to update that team name, huh? I think so. Now it's Peaked in College. Yeah. Caleb had another impressive round in Double Jeopardy that would have been even more impressive if he had been correct on both of the Daily Doubles. Halfway through the round, he's already at over $20,000. He wagers $10,018. He was correct. He's now over $30,000. But a few clues later, he finds a second Daily Double, wagers $10,018 yet again, and he gets it incorrect. So, you know, he yeah. balances out. Some people might take issue with this. He's wagering 5000 on a Daily Double in the Jeopardy round, 10000 on a Daily Double <laughs> in the Double Jeopardy round. And honestly, I'm not so mad at it. You know, he's got a big lead. Go for it. I, I, you know, just keep going for it. And as you can see, even with losing the $10,000, he still had a runaway game. Well, heading into final, unfortunately, Maggie did not make it to final Jeopardy. Caleb was the only one who was correct. I have to share a little insight. I was able to talk with Maggie's mom after the tournament. Of course, you know, a lot of emotions, but she was so complimentary that we had invited all of these teens back. You know, each of the individual groups from both tournaments were very close in their, you know, Mm -hmm. groups of 15. But then we brought them all together and she said what had happened was just so incredible. In fact, after the finals, None of the parents, she said, they just couldn't split up the party. Like they knew everyone had to get up the next day and fly home, but the kids were having, the kids, the recent adults, as we like to call them, Buzzy, (laughs) were having so much fun together. They were just enjoying that camaraderie of this unique group. And it was really fun to talk to one of the parents to just experience it. I can't imagine, you know, either of us, we both have kids, to think about our kids competing not once but twice on Jeopardy Mm -hmm. and to have this camaraderie among these like-minded individuals like what an incredible experience especially when you have it twice yeah especially when you're kind of stepping out into the world in this way I'd like to go back to final for a second because I really felt for Hannah who was ruled incorrect because she did not complete manifesto the clue was in nonfiction, it has the line the discovery of america opened up fresh ground for the rising bourgeoisie caleb got what is the communist manifesto hannah wrote what is the communist man clearly going for manifesto however as we've said before it was not a complete response and therefore ruled against her caleb is now our ninth semi-finalist if i may now announce our field of semi-finalists are you okay with take that? it away Buzzy. We take it away maya wright avi gupta stephanie pearson justin bolson jackson jones claire sattler lucas minor tim joe and now caleb richmond the quarterfinals of the quarter quell have ended and now it's the semis. That's right. We kicked off the semifinals on Friday with Lucas Minor going up against Jackson Jones and Avi Gupta. Avi, obviously a champion from the previous teen tournament. You have to think there might have been a bit of a target on his back. In the Jeopardy round, Jackson was the one who scored an early daily double, took a strong lead heading into double Jeopardy, looking like he could not be caught. I believe, did Jackson and Avi face each other in a semifinal previously where Avi was victorious? So maybe not only does Avi have a little bit of a target on his back, but maybe there's a little bit of a vendetta. Absolutely. Redemption. 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 Jackson was out for redemption. Jackson was on fire. Double Jeopardy round just continues that leap. Although after a slow start in the Jeopardy round, Avi really turned it on. Not enough to make Jackson play Final Jeopardy, 
but really makes up some ground there. Yeah. And a stat to provide for you. Earlier in the quarterfinals, Tim Joe had the most correct responses at 29. In this game, Jackson ties him for 29. So proving just what a strong game that Jackson was having. We head into final. Jackson not able to come up with the correct response, but Lucas is. However, Jackson said, you know what? I just wanted to be able to bet my mom's birthday, 1220. So it doesn't matter if he got it right or wrong. He got to call out his mom. Buzzy alluded to it, but in their semifinal in the 2019 teen tournament, they had a tiebreaker. Yeah. And that is just such a tough way to tough lose. Way to go. Yeah. And obviously, Avi had beat Jackson in that tiebreaker many years ago, but this was Jackson's day. He was brought to tears, very emotional when he got that win. I had a chance to catch up with him. Let's take a listen. Jackson, you are headed to the finals. How does it feel? It feels amazing. I'm still shocked, surprised. I tried to come in here as confident as I could, but knowing that there are 26 other amazingly smart people that I'm competing against, it was really hard to, you know, be able to tell myself, oh, I'm going to the finals. I'm going to do great without any sort of, you know, doubt. So I have to ask, when you left the stage years ago, you know, as rules being what they have been in the past, there was no chance we were going to see you back on the Alex Trebek stage. What went through your mind when you first got the call? Uh, The way I lost last time in a tiebreaker that is on the internet for everybody to see (laughs) was incredibly painful. And I so desperately wanted some sort of redemption and I didn't think I would ever get it. Redemption with a runaway. That had to feel pretty good. Yes, it did. It's my first runaway too. Yeah, what's it like going into final knowing that you can bet a very special wager? It, it, It was a really good feeling. I had that in my head that I wanted to do that. And again, with how many other amazingly smart people are here, I knew there'd be a lot of close games and I didn't think I would be able to get the opportunity to do that. And I'm just really glad that I was able to. All right, the finals await you. Anything you're gonna do differently? No, just try to be myself. It's worked so far. It has worked so far. Enjoy this moment. Enjoy this win. And we'll see you in the finals. Thank you so much. I'm excited to see who joins Jackson. And I'm excited to see Jackson play some more. That was an incredible, incredible semifinal match. All right. Well, with that, let's take some viewer questions. Steven asks, since the last TOC and the high school reunion tourney are both single elimination with no wild cards, are the contestants still being sequestered prior to their quarterfinal games, or are they allowed to watch and scout the rest of the competition? Great question, Stephen, and really good analytics. You're exactly correct. Because there are no wild cards, everyone just gets to watch. It's like any other kind of sporting event. You know, you get to see some teams go ahead of other teams. You get to watch their gameplay. It's all picked at random, so the order of the games is not something, you know, we predetermine. It's it's helped out with our S&P company. So, yeah, in fact, you may get to see next week for the finals, they're all in the audience, in fact. They've got their Jeopardy! red sweatshirts. It was the first time where our audience um, members were allowed to take off their masks. Wow. So you're going to see the high school reunion tournament kids living it up, cheering on their friends in the audience watching each and every game. So great question. Ryan asks, do we foresee the GOAT theme to return for Jeopardy Masters or will they get an all new epic theme? I feel like this competition is certainly deserving of one. Ryan, you are so right. This competition (laughs) is deserving of one. Uh, We work with Bleeding Fingers. I'm Mm -hmm. sure you're familiar with them, Buzzy. They do create all of our music and they are working on a one of a kind new piece of music for masters. We can't wait for you to hear it. I've been dancing along to the beat myself this morning as we just got one of the cuts back. So Mm, I wonder if Michael Peterson Davies and Johnny Gilbert are in studio as we that's why Michael that's why Michael that's why Michael hasn't been on the pod lately. He's at the studio and Johnny Gilbert of course shredding shredding on the axe. Yep. Well thank you for the great questions. Keep them coming. That brings us to the end of today's show. We'll be back next Monday to discuss the two remaining semifinals and of course that two day 
total point affair final. Oh, you love to say it, Buzzy. I love to say it. Two-day total point affair. I'll say it a few more times. One more time. Two-day total total point point affair. affair. Oh, yes. We are so close to crowning the champion of the high school reunion tournament, who, as a reminder, will receive $100,000. But most importantly, they're getting a spot in our next tournament of champions. And then on Friday, we are going to welcome back three-day champion Stephen Webb. You may have forgotten about Stephen. He was off to a great start, so we're going to welcome him back on Friday. There will be lots to discuss. You won't want to miss it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, and follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok. And send us those questions inside Jeopardy Podcast at gmail.com. See you next week, everybody. Hey Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that.